Wigfred, the dedicated combat character. Spawning in with formidable armor and decent weaponry, she starts the game completely battle ready and only gets better. The way she fights enemies doesn't differ much from the way everyone else does, but her unique health and sanity steal mechanics makes fighting feel a whole lot different. She gains a bit of health and sanity on every hit, which not only increases Wigfred's survivability in a skirmish, but depending on the player's ability to kite, they can leave a fight with much more HP than they started with. Therefore, if you're good enough at kiting, you can do things like eat raw monster meat or ignore the damage from freezing and overheating to a certain extent, since you can just restore all your stats by killing enemies. The game alerts you with dopamine-inducing sound effects every time Wigfred's health and sanity go up, which encourages the player even more to take advantage of her in combat. DST is full of challenges, but the greatest of them the game has to offer comes in the form of 9 raid bosses. These guys are in my opinion the toughest challenges in the game. Even the weakest of them has about triple the health of normal seasonal bosses, while others have even more health than 10 Deerclops. Health isn't really the thing that makes them dangerous. What makes raid bosses a challenge is that they not only can hit way harder than regular ones, but their special abilities and mechanics makes fighting them a whole lot more complex than the way one typically deals with enemies in this game. So if you're interested in seeing how she fares against these guys, stick around as I recap my all raid boss rush that I did as Wigfred. Before the run starts, let's go over the game plan. Half the fun of Wigfrid is using her in fights. The other half is her unique path to leveling up. The typical character will level up by acquiring strong weapons, armor, healing food, and utility items that boost their speed. These pretty much all apply to Wigfrid as well. However, she has a bunch of unique tools on top of that. The most obvious are her battle songs. There are 7 in total, but I'd say only 4 of them are really useful in single player. Heartrending Ballad heals Wigfrid 0.5 HP every time she lands a hit, which greatly increases her regeneration. Pure Mighty Cadenza gives her 1 sanity point for each hit, which rapidly increases her sanity. The Council of Courage halves the insanity aura of enemies, which is extremely useful against one boss in particular. Finally, Weaponized Warble decreases weapon durability drain by 25%, which is great for tanky enemies and battles where handbats aren't viable. All four songs require an ingredient that's pretty rare. This means Wigfred has to get lucky with digging up graves, obtain tier 1 magic, venture into the ruins or sail across the seas to Lunar Island. Once you've finally done all that and have obtained the song, you've effectively leveled Wigfred up, as now she is permanently stronger than she ever was before. Wigfred's potential doesn't stop with the battle songs. Due to her unique health and sanity regeneration on hit, there are two items that permanently buff her in a way they don't most other characters. These are the Enlightened Crown and the more recently added Dreadstone Armors. When the character's sanity is above 85% and wearing the Enlightened Crown, every time they attack something, a Minor Gestalt will also attack the target. The Minor Gestalt deals 42.5 damage, but each time one is summoned, the player's sanity will decrease by 1. So normal characters will need to bring a ton of sanity restoring food in order to truly take advantage of the crown. However, this does not apply to Wigfrid. With Clear Mighty Cadenza activated, Wigfrid is gaining at least 1 sanity per hit, so the song essentially cancels out the downside of the Enlightened Crown, resulting in Wigfrid effectively getting a permanent 42.5 damage increase to all of her attacks. In other words, after getting the crown, she essentially hits as hard as Wolfgang. While the Enlightened Crown permanently increases Wigfrid's offensive power, the Dreadstone Armors permanently increases her defense. While worn, the Dreadstone Armors regenerate durability over time, at the cost of a pretty big sanity drain. For most characters, this can be a death sentence, since the last thing anyone wants is to be dealing with multiple terror beaks while fighting a raid boss. However, this issue is non-existent with Wigfrid, since just her base sanity restoration will more than cancel out the sanity drain of the armor. This means that while fighting, Wigfrid has 90% armor that regenerates over time without any downsides. Couple that with her natural defenses, plus heart ranking healing, and Wigfrid doesn't need any other healing item unless she is forced to tank an enormous amount of damage. The Dreadstone Armors are useful outside of combat too, since the rapid sanity drain allows Wigfrid to get a lot of Nightmare Fuel, a task that is often difficult since she gains so much sanity from fights. I won't really be using the Enlightened Crown since Celestial Champion is the final boss, however I will be taking advantage of the Dreadstone Helm to essentially get unlimited 90% armor. So that's the plan, I'll be fighting bosses while taking advantage of Wigfrid's inherent combat perks, Battle Songs, and Dreadstone Armor. Because I'll have to move heavy objects like the Suspicious Marpo and the Celestial Altar Pieces, I'll be rush taming a Beefalo. Wigfrid is a combat character who not only greatly outdamages the Beefalo, but also regenerates health and armor, so the Rider Beefalo is simply way better than the Ornery for her. So after spawning in, I did the usual and collected a bunch of grass, twigs, and flint. If you're taming a Beefalo, a Twiggy Tree, Grass Gecko, and Juicy Berry World is better, so if you really want to give yourself every advantage, I'd regenerate the world until I get those resources. I got stuck with regular saplings and grass tufts, but I did get juicy berries, so I can't complain. After collecting my starting materials, I headed to the mosaic in order to mine some rocks. Like usual, I'm here to get a bunch of rocks, gold, and flint. Except I want to get even more gold and rocks, since they are required to make Wigfrid's battle helms. 
taking spawn right next to the mosaic. And since I did this run during the Hallowed Knights event, I took some time to grab all the pumpkins, as these will provide tons of food for my beefalo. I then hammered some pig houses, mined some more rocks, I made a backpack, shovel, and razor before night. With my new shovel, I dug up all the graves, since the trinkets they yield can be traded to Pig King, and there's also a chance that I'll get either a red gem or a life-giving amulet for Wakeford's heart-running ballad battle song. After I got my red gem, I traded all the trinkets to Pig King for gold, killed tall birds for meat, and headed off to search for beefalo. Beefalo are either in the huge savanna biome or a small patch in the Mandrake Forest. I ended up finding them in the latter. Once I found them, I immediately fed one a ton of pumpkins. Each pumpkin is worth 37.5 hunger points, which means just one will keep my beefalo fed for almost a whole minute. During night, I shaved two other beefalo for their wool, which is the last ingredient I needed to craft a saddle. The next day, I took a short dive into the caves for light bulbs, and soon after started to set up base in the crossroads right outside of Dragonfly Desert. This location was really good, as it not only grants me easy access to the resources of Dragonfly Desert, but it's also very central, near Bee Queen and the Spider Quarry, and there's a wormhole nearby that leads to the mosaic. Using the alchemy engine that I just built, I crafted a saddle for my beefalo and a lantern. With that, I was ready to explore the map at beefalo speed. Like usual, my primary objective is to find the Suspicious Marble and their set piece, as well as the Terrarium. However, since I'm playing Wigfrid, I have a few additional objectives that need to be done before heading to the caves. One is to find Lunar Island, and another is to collect a ton of reeds for my battle songs. While doing all of this, I'll be keeping an eye out for Pearl's message in a bottle if they happen to spawn near a coast. So I spent the next 6 days running around the entire map. While doing this, I hammered pig houses for their materials, dug up graves in hopes of getting a life-giving amulet, destroyed spider dents for silk, and dug up spiky bushes to be replanted back at base. The spiky bushes are great because unlike the regular saplings, they don't stop growing in summer and winter, so being short on twigs is never an issue. On day 6, I found the terrarium near a bunch of spiders, and on day 7, I found a message in a bottle floating off the coast of the killer bee biome. By the end of day 8, I had searched the entire map except for the swamp without finding a single suspicious marble or their set piece. Therefore, all of that had to be in the swamp. On day 9, I found everything, and by day 10, all the pieces were assembled. Now there was only one more task to complete before heading to the caves, Lunar Island. After building a bunch of crockpots and a birdcage at base, I headed off to Lunar Island at the start of day 12. Once there, I assembled the Celestial Altar and crafted glass cutters and glass axes. Both of these will really come in handy for two of the hardest bosses I'll be facing in this run. Before heading back to the mainland, I collected two stacks of bull kelp stalks, which will give me all the vegetable fillers I'll need to make meatballs, pierogies, and tall scotch eggs. Lastly, since I'm wig for it, I got one Lunar Moth, since it's a key ingredient for the Clear Mighty Cadenza battle song. After crafting the song back at base, I planted all the kelp and headed to the caves. While down here, I have the usual objectives which are to go to the ruins, locate Toadstool, and get the fossil fragments. The glass axes I made back on Lunar Island are for the Toadstool fight, so before heading to the ruins, I dropped all of them off at Toadstool's arena. Before I headed to the ruins, I also stopped at the Blue Mushroom Forest to kill some gnomes for living logs. After that, it was finally ruins rushing time. I ignored everything in the wilds and headed straight for the first ruins branch that I could find. Fortunately, this one contained AG. Before fighting him, I made a Tulusite medallion to pinpoint his exact location and the magi for light. After bobbing and weaving through the dangling depth weather webs, I dropped my beeflo at the edge of the arena, fed it a bunch of food, and started the AG fight. After that, I finally came around to looting the chest. Luckily, I got a lazy explorer, a Tudosite suit, and a bunch of yellow gems. 
So I have everything I need to finish up in the ruins once I get back to the pseudoscience station. Back at the station, I made two star collar staffs, two through the site clubs, a deconstruction staff, a construction amulet, and a pick slash axe. Now that I was done with all my crafting, I dropped the glass cutters and ancient key at the station and headed out of the ruins. Remember when I said that one of the cave objectives was to get the fossil fragments? I think around this point in the run, I changed my objectives up a bit. Since I won't be needing the fragments until the second time I head to the caves to fight Fuel Weaver, I decided to fight the Nightmare Wear Pig instead. After finding him, I freed him by vibrating the pillars, killed the Shadelings once my sanity got low enough, and then initiated the fight. Just like the Ancient Guardian, I consider this guy above the average seasonal boss, but not quite as strong as a raid boss. He has 10,000 HP and in his first phase will try to body slam him. Getting hit by the body slam knocks the player to the ground, which makes fighting this guy on a beef flow pretty risky. Since I have the magic, dodging this guy isn't hard, and after doing so three times in a row, the Nightmare Wear Pig will go into his huffing state, where he sits there and lets you wail on him for free. That's basically all he does in phase 1. This guy has a very strong insanity aura, which causes Wigfrid to go insane even if she's gaining back sanity from fighting. Because of this, I have to deal with crawling horrors from time to time. This could have all been prevented if I had simply remembered that I had the Bell Canto of Courage battle song in my piggyback. However, my mind wasn't all there, so I just powered through the fight, nightmare creatures and all. Once the Nightmare Wear Pig's HP drops below 5000, he goes into the smashing phase. I just bait him into smashing the pillars, and then re-engage him while fighting the Nightmares from time to time. The smash creates craters that significantly slow you down. Just another thing to be mindful of when he's doing this. After his HP drops to 3000, he enters his final phase, where he again tries to body slam you, except this time he will follow up a successful body slam immediately with a ground smash. All I do is put a little effort into kiting this guy so I don't get hit. After a pretty fun fight, the Nightmare Wear Pig goes down in about 3.5 minutes. He drops 3 blueprints, one of the Dreadstone Pillar, another for the Dreadstone Armor, and the final one for the Dreadstone Helm. The Helm is the entire reason why I decided to fight him, now and not later. As explained in the earlier part of the video, the Dreadstone Helm is Wigfred's unique way of leveling up, since for most bosses, it grants her unlimited 90% armor without any downsides. With the Helm acquired, I drop off the rest of the Dreadstone at Toadstool, get a couple more Living Logs from the Mush Gnomes, and exit the caves on day 20. With the first cave expedition done, it's now boss killing time. On day 21, I prepare for the shadow pieces fight by making a small cobblestone road right next to the set piece. After doing that, I put my beefalo away and fed it a bunch of steam twigs. Then once night fell, I mined the statues to start the fight. I'm doing the pieces in the usual order which is knight, bishop, and rook. The level 1 knight only has 800 HP, so in phase 1, I attack it while trying to avoid the attacks from the bishop and rook. Once the knight dies, both pieces level up to 2. In this form, they are both technically bosses, which is reflected by the greatly increased HP and attack power. In this phase, I'm trying to kill the bishop while doing my best to avoid both its and the rook's attacks. The rook can be dodged, however I don't have nearly enough speed to outright dodge the bishop, so I have to eat a hit or two every time it teleports. Since I'm using the Dreadstone Helm, Wigfrid effectively has 92.5% armor, which means her natural healing ability is more than sufficient to recover from damage. Because of this, the only battle song that I need is Clear Mighty Cadenza, which lets Wigfrid wear the Dreadstone Helm without having to worry about dealing with Nightmare Creatures. After the Bishop is defeated, the Rook levels up to 3. In my opinion, this is the easiest phase of the fight, as long as you've done the necessary preparations. The Rook hits really hard, but he literally only has one attack. This attack is undodgeable if you don't have enough speed. With a 20% boost of the Magi, 25% boost of the Lazy Explorer, and 30% boost of the Cobblestone Road, I have way more than enough speed to dodge the Rook. Phase 3 might be the longest, but in my opinion, it's the easiest phase of the fight.
On day 22, the level 3 rook goes down and I exit the fight at full HP and sanity. After grabbing all the loot and my beefalo, I returned to the base and started to prepare for the next boss on the list, Dragonfly. Like the shadow pieces, I don't need any song other than clear mighty cadenza for this fight, since 90% armor that regenerates over time is more than sufficient for defense. After setting up the walls, putting my beefalo away, and making a fresh hand bat, I started the fight. Dragonfly is probably the first raid boss that everyone defeats. It has 27,500 HP and has a kiting pattern that punishes you if you dodge too early or too late. The way Wigfrid fights Dragonfly is the same as any other character. Attack 6 times and then dodge, 7 if you're using animation cancelling like me. I think at one point I was animation cancelling too quickly, which causes me to eat slaps even after attacking 7 times. Anyways, Wakefred is dealing 74 damage per hit, which makes phase 1 go by quicker than usual. Once Dragonfly's HP drops below 22,000, it starts flying to its lava ponds to spawn lava. While doing this, it will ignore Wakefred completely, so instead of chilling out behind the walls I built, I chase her down until she spawned three of them. After that, I run back to the Dwarf Star and wait for Dragonfly to return. After she flies over the wall, I engage her again, attacking her seven times and then dodging. The lava recognize the walls I've built as obstacles, but they're blind to lava ponds so they get stuck on the inside of the pond and one by one explode into a fiery mess. Once the last lava dies, Dragonfly has a 50% chance to enrage and a 50% chance to fly away and spawn more. If she flies away, I equip the Lazy Explorer and chase her down to deal free damage. With the Lazy Explorer and Magi, Wigfrid is moving 50% faster than default speed, which allows her to chase down Dragonfly while ignoring her lava. Like mentioned earlier, whenever the lava die, Dragonfly has a 50% chance to spawn more or enrage. In this fight, by sheer chance, every time all of her lava dies, she ends up flying away to spawn more. While this does preserve the pan flute, I think it also makes the fight drag on for longer. After a 6.5 minute fight, Dragonfly dies on day 24. I don't really need the runes gems, so I leave them there and bring back the gold, meat, and red, blue, and purple gems. Since I've done almost no fighting with my beefalo, the next time I feed it, it fully tames as a rider. The next boss that I usually fight is Kloss, however the Dreadstone Helm got pretty banged up in the Dragonfly fight, so I decided to work on magic while waiting for it to recover. So I captured a bunch of rabbits and built a Presti, then used the Living Logs and the Purple Gem to make the Shadow Manipulator. Now that I had magic, I could finally craft a life-giving amulet and therefore obtain Wigfrid's most important battle song, the Heartrending Ballad. By then, the Dreadstone Helm regenerated to over 60% durability, so it was time to go search for the No Idea and Claws. While searching for them, the Dreadstone Helm made Wigfrid insane, which is a good thing, since her sanity regeneration often makes it hard to get Nightmare Fuel. I also have a Rider Beefalo, so if I don't feel like fighting Nightmare Creatures, I can simply outrun them as well. After having no luck finding Claws in the second Birchnut Biome and the Mosaic, I finally found both the Deer and the Loot Stash in the Picking Biome. By this time, my Dreadstone Helm was back to 100%, so I dropped my Beefalo Bell away from the stash, equipped the Magi, and socketed the Deer Antler to summon Claus. Claus is widely regarded as the easiest of all the raid bosses. He only has 10,000 HP in his first phase, and deals just 37.5 damage per hit. In fact, his Deer hit harder than him, which is why it's important to position yourself so that you're not within their attack range. The kiting pattern for Kloss is pretty simple. I get close in order to bait an attack from him, and then dodge it, and then I get a few hits in before he tries to double swipe me again. After this, he'll make his gem deer cast a spell. If it's the fire spell, I just keep on attacking him until the spell circle materializes, 
at which point I dodge it by running in the opposite direction. If it's the Ice Spell, I immediately run around Klaus on the side of the blue gem deer and attack him until the spell is completely activated. Then I dodge his swipes and repeat the kiting pattern all over again. Once Klaus's health drops below 5000, he summons Krampus. These guys attack quickly and hit as hard as the gem deer. The kiting pattern for them is to hit them once and then dodge over and over until they're dead. I usually have really bad luck when it comes to Krampus sacks, but things were a bit different in this run, considering the first Krampus that I killed dropped the best backpack item in the game. After both Krampus are dead, it's back to fighting Klaus. Looking back on this fight, I think an even better strategy I could have been using is to just tank the fire spell instead of dodging it. Wigford's natural defenses applies to fire damage, and Heart Running Ballad is giving her way more heals than she needs otherwise. Therefore, just eating the fire damage is probably the way to go if you're trying to beat Klaus as quickly as possible. After Klaus's HP goes to zero, he dies and gets revived by the life-giving amulet around his neck. He is now in phase 2. In this phase, he pretty much does the same thing as in phase 1, except he gains a pounce attack that requires you to start running away from him pretty early if you don't have speed buffs. Fortunately for me, I have the Magi and the Lazy Explorer, which boosts my speed to the point that I only have to dodge him at the very last second before he pounces. In phase 2, Klaus only has 5000 HP, so it's much shorter than phase 1. Once Klaus is dead, I grab all the loot and head back to base. It's now day 27 and the next raid boss on the list is Bee Queen. Unlike all the bosses that I've fought until now, Bee Queen will require Wakefair to tank a ton of damage, so the Dreadzone Helm isn't the armor that I'll be using. Instead, I'm going to spam a ton of Battle Helms. Battle Helms aren't the only item that I'll be bringing. To fight Bee Queen, I'll have to utilize various armors, actual healing food, weapons stronger than a handbat, and pan foods. So I spend some time prepping that stuff. I killed spiders and picked kelp to make a bunch of pierogies for healing, turn the dead mandrakes into multiple pan flutes, make three dark swords, and craft a ton of battle helms. With all that prepared, I hammered Bee Queen's hive just before the night of day 28 to start the fight. After Bee Queen is activated, I pan flute her and her grumbles. Then I get to killing all of them but one. In Bee Queen's first phase, as long as one grumble bee is alive, she won't spawn anymore, so I can just attack her while tanking the stings from both of them. I'm using battle helms for my head slot, and in my chest slot, I'm equipping the knight armor, which grants its wear 95% damage reduction. This results in Wigford taking so little damage that Heart Running Ballad alone is more than enough to keep her health topped off. Once the Knight Armor is destroyed, I swap to the Thucite suit. The suit doesn't block quite as much as the Knight Armor, but its 90% damage resistance makes Wigfrid's HP go down very slowly over time. Once Bee Queen's HP dips below 3 quarters, she enters Phase 2, which is the most annoying of all the phases. Here, she will spawn double the amount of Grumble Bees as she did in Phase 1, and you can't get away with killing all but one. So I just abuse the Pan Flute over and over to put her to sleep and land a bunch of attacks on her before her Grumbles get to me, while tanking Bee Queen's attacks. Halfway through phase 2, I realized that it's probably better for me to use the Magi instead of the suit, since the Magi's speed will allow me to land more attacks in between pan flutes. This causes me to take more damage, but that's not really an issue since I have so many pierogies in reserve. Once Bee Queen's health drops below half, she enters phase 3. In this phase, she will scream at her Grumble Bees, which causes them to chase Wigford down at supersonic speeds. The strategy for this phase is to use your own super speed to lead them as far away from Bee Queen as possible, and then run through them the moment they return back to normal. If done right, you'll be able to get back to Bee Queen and deal a bunch of damage to her before her grumbles return. Sometimes I'm not able to lead them that far. In these instances, I just use a pan flute to put both them and the Queen to sleep, which lets me do free damage to the Queen before the grumbles wake up and get back to her. 
This is much easier to do in the other seasons, since you can utilize roads to get much faster. However, it's winter, so the ground is covered in snow, which prevents me from seeing where the roads are. In this fight, I managed to lead the Grumble Bees too far away from the Queen, which is a huge mistake. When this happens, the Grumbles become decoupled from Bee Queen, which causes her to spawn a whole set of new ones. This is really bad because now I have to deal with double the minion spam, and half of them move independently from the Queen's screams. To deal with this, I end up pan fluting everything, and killing most of the stray bees while they are asleep. After that, the fight basically becomes the same as how it should be. I lead the Grumble Bees away from the Queen, and attack her while they slowly fly back. After a fight that lasts almost 10 minutes, Bee Queen dies on the night of day 29. I then learned the Bundle Wrap Blueprint, picked up the Royal Jelly, and once back at base, turned them into Jelly Beans. On night 30, I put my Beefalo away and hung out in a really thick forest while I waited for Deer Cops to appear. Once he spawned in, I made him destroy a bunch of trees until night was over. After that, I killed him because I really wanted an Ibrella. Deer Cops is no raid boss, as he only has 4000 HP and has one very basic attack that can be dodged without any special items or tricks. Like the Nightmare Werepig, this guy has a negative 400 sanity per minute aura, but that doesn't matter to wake for it, since Clear Magic Cadenza alone overpowers it. After Deerclops dies, I pick up his loot and all the logs from the trees that he destroyed. Then I headed back to base and got ready to fight the Twins of Terror. There's nothing really special about the way Wakeford fights the twins. Once they spawn in, I pan flew both of them to sleep and then focus my fire on spasmatism while leading it away from Retinazer. Since night 31 is a full moon, I can see everything which makes dodging this guy really easy. Each twin has 10,000 HP, but I'm fighting it with a fresh handbat as Wakeford, so I'm able to take out spasmatism in one night. Once Spasmatism's HP drops to 3000, he and Retinazer enter Phase 2, a phase where they will start chain charging. Spasmatism charges way faster and more frequently than Retinazer, but with the super speed of the Magi and Lazy Explorer, plus full night vision, dodging him isn't an issue. The next night I activated the Corrupted Terrarium again, in order to summon Retinazer. Fighting this guy was much more difficult than Spasmatism, just because I was in an area with lots of obstacles and water, and I only had the small light radius of the Magi to see with. In addition to that, I forgot my Thermal Stolen at base, so I quickly began to freeze. I decided to just ignore this and tank the freeze damage with the heals I'm getting from Heartrending. Not being able to see all the suspicious peepers that this guy spawned in was pretty annoying, but with the self-repair of the Dreadstone Helm and healing I'm getting from Heartrending, their attacks were basically doing nothing to me.
Unfortunately, I activated the Terrarium late, so Retinazer escapes with 2000 HP. On Night 33, I activate the Terrarium once again to finish him off. With Retinazer dead, I've conquered all the mainland surface raid bosses. The next ones on the list are the two really strong ones in the caves. So I spent the day preparing all the items, weaponry, and food that I needed for this adventure, because it'll probably take quite a few days. Once I had everything, I left the base and headed down to the caves on day 34. The caves are raining hard, which is really good, since one of the items that I brought with me was a Morning Star. Toadstool is the first boss that I'll be fighting, so I headed straight to his spawner that I had found the first time I went spelunking. Once there, I picked up all the glass axes that I had dropped earlier, put my beefalo and everything I didn't need away from the fight, and then chopped the mushroom to wake Toadstool up. In phase 1 and 2, Toadstool has two moves, Boom Shrooms and Spore Bombs. The Boom Shrooms detonate after a few seconds, dealing a base 100 damage, while the Spore Bombs turn into Spore Clouds that not only deal constant damage, but also rapidly spoils food. In my Esther Wigford video, I used a Hambat at the end of the fight, which is viable, but a step down from using the stronger weapons that I have this time. Since the caves are wet, I'm using the Morning Star, which drains durability over time, and deals a flat 90 damage in the hands of Wigfred, making it the best weapon for this situation. After 45 seconds, Tolstoy will begin to walk back to the center. While he's doing this, he will completely ignore Wigfred, so it's an opportunity to deal as much damage as possible. If he's far away from the center, he'll walk for a maximum of 15 seconds before starting to spawn spore caps. Normally, I'd let him spawn all 8 of them, then let him chase me to the outside of the ponds and then pan food him there. However, this time I decided to experiment a little and lure him while fighting him like I did at the very start of the fight. The glass axes are 2.5 times as efficient as normal axes, so they only take 4 chops to fell a spore cap. I only have 2 more left to chop by the time Toadstool wakes up. After chopping both of them, it's back to fighting Toadstool. I attack him by animation cancelling the Morning Star and continue to lead him to the outside of the arena and behind one of the ponds. This arena is pretty bad. Usually I'd want to lure Toadstool to the outside of the closest pond to the center, however that one was right next to the Void, so it's a no-go. The other two weren't much better as both were located close to the Void as well, meaning I wouldn't have a lot of room to move around. I decided to lure it to the pond next to a pillar, which turned out to be a potentially huge mistake, as you will see later. Since I'm doing so much damage with the Morning Star, Toadstool enters phase 2 before the end of the second cycle. I might as well mention now that the only song I really need at the moment is Pyramided Cadenza to keep away the nightmare creatures. Like so many of the other fights, the Dressone Helm is just such high armor that what little damage does get through is healed up in no time by Wakefred's default regeneration. Toadstool's health drops below 21,000, it enters into phase 3. Of course, since this is DST, I get a Death Worm attack right in the middle of a raid boss fight. Fortunately, it's just one, and Toadstool ends up helping me kill it with its new Double Stomp attack. The Double Stomp is the only difference between phase 3 and the other ones. It's not hard to avoid, especially if you have an idea about the timing. The interval of these stomps is based on Toadstool's current HP. When Toadstool's HP is around 20,000, he'll Double Stomp about every 20 seconds. As Toadstool's HP becomes lower and lower, the double stomp interval becomes smaller to the point where Toadstool will be double stomping once every 10 seconds when he's almost dead.
towards the very end of the fight, I finally run out of the Morning Star and have to switch to the Thulicite Club. The club is almost as powerful as the Morning Star, and with Weaponized Warble, has over 260 uses, so it's more than capable of finishing the rest of the fight. Remember when I said luring Tolstoy to this pond was a big mistake? Well, this is why. Apparently, Tolstoy can spawn spore caps right in the middle of the spalagmite pillars, which makes them impossible to chop. I'm not even sure if I could have gotten this if I had the weather pane. The only solution I can think of would be to light something on fire next to it, and hope it spreads to the spore cap. Either way, having to fight a Tolstoy that is permanently powered up can potentially be very bad. Luckily for me, this happened when Tolstoy had less than 2000 HP left, so I just killed him while he was powered up. This guy doesn't drop anything useful for boss rushing, so I just take the meat, grab all my stuff, and start getting the fossil fragments. The arena was right next to the bread mushroom forest, so I just killed a bunch of spiders and mined spalagmites until I had all eight. Then I headed to the ancient pseudoscience station in the ruins to pick up the two glass cutters and the ancient key. With that, I had everything I needed for Fuel Weaver. After finding the atrium bridge, I put down the gate and cheated into the void. My beefalo can't follow me into the void, but he'll teleport to me if I move far enough away from him, which lets me void walk at beefalo speed. Once I located the atrium, I got off my beefalo and teleported in. I then maxed out my sanity using the Dwarf Star Sanity Station, built the correct statue, and organized my inventory. Since sanity is such a huge deal in the Fuel Weaver fight, I'm using a ton of battle helms for armor instead of the Dreadstone Helm. Since I'm using a weaker armor, I'm also bringing jelly beans and pierogi for extra healing. Once everything is ready, I insert the Shadow Atrium into the skeleton to start the fight. Phase 1 was a little weird. Usually I would attack Fuel Weaver a bunch, and then run away to dodge his first bone snare, because if you successfully dodge it, then he won't use the snare for quite some time. However, for some reason, he just snares me again. This doesn't really matter, because the gear I have gives me the option to just tank him if I want to, so I teleport into the corner and activate Heartrending Ballad, and just face tank the rest of Phase 1. In this fight, I'm using 3 songs. The most important are the first two, because Bell Council of Courage cuts his insanity aura in half, and Clear Minded allows me to rapidly restore my sanity by attacking him. Heartrending is helpful, but not necessary, since I have other means of healing. After Fuel Weaver's HP drops below 10,000, he generates his force field which is a sign that he's entered phase 2. Right after shielding himself, he immediately summons Woven Shadows. Since I don't have weather pains, and quite frankly because I think it's funner this way, I keep Fuel Weaver on the perimeter of the arena and walk him around his Woven Shadows in a big circle while destroying the Unseen Hands. Once I've done a complete circle, and only have one unseen hand left, I lure Fuel Weaver into a corner, smack the hand, and start face tanking him. The glass cutters are great against Fuel Weaver. Their durability drains half as quickly when fighting shadow creatures, such as Fuel Weaver, and in the hands of Wigfred, they are dealing 85 damage per hit. Combine that with animation cancelling, and I'm able to drop Fuel Weaver's health by well over 3000 by the time it puts its shield back up. Once Fuel Weaver does this, I keep him on the perimeter of the arena while dodging his bone snares, until he summons Woven Shadows again. After he summons them, instead of repeating what I did last time, I let him bend down and try to eat one, and then use that opportunity to kill a bunch of them for health and sanity. After that, I lure him around the arena in the opposite direction, and tank him once I get him into a corner just like I did last time.
After a pretty good fight, Q-Weaver is defeated on day 39. With that, we're done with all the mainland raid bosses. Now it's time to beat the two ocean ones. Before that, I gave the 5 Dreadstone to Charlie, because it's always cool to see this cutscene. After picking up the Bone Helm and armor, I hopped back on my beefalo and headed back to the surface. At base, I put all the stuff that I didn't need anymore away, and started farming because I'll eventually need potatoes for moonstorms. Then I mined a bunch of boulders for rocks, traded trinkets for gold, mined meteors for moon rocks, used a bug net to catch a firefly and 10 butterflies, killed beefalo for wool, and used it to make carpet flooring. I killed a moose goose because I wanted a luxury fan, and after digging up 8 juicy berry bushes, I finally set sail to Pearls Island. After getting there, I started to work on our chores. For some reason, the game didn't spawn the lure plant that appears every spring, so I couldn't get that chore done. The first one I did was plant 10 flowers for her bees. Next, I hung kelp on her 6 drying racks, and followed this up by planting and fertilizing the 8 juicy berry bushes. In order to upgrade her house, I needed to get 10 cookie cutter shells, so I started searching the ocean for these. Instead of doing circles around Pearl's Island, I paddled in a straight line near the edge of the coastal water. I think this might be a better way to search for the salt formations, since paddling in a straight line means you're preserving the boat's momentum, and the salt formations often appear along the coast. After paddling for almost a game day, I spotted the salt formations and two minutes later, had all the cookie cutter shells I'd need. Back at Pearl's Island, I completed upgrading her house all the way to level 3. With this, I had 6 friendship points, just 4 more to go. I got point number 7 from picking up all the trash in the water. The next day it started raining, so I handed Pearl an umbrella for the 8th point. With that out of the way, I headed back to the mainland to prepare for the Moonstone event. Once at the Moonstone, I quickly built walls around it, socketed the Starcaller staff, and blocked off the rest using fossil pieces. At night, the Moonstone activated calling hordes of hostile hounds and werepigs to try and destroy it. While these guys recognize the walls as obstacles, they can't see the fossil pieces, so they spent all their time stuck on the pieces until the staff's transformation is complete. With the Mooncaller staff in hand, I headed back to base and deconstructed it for the Iridescent Gem. Now I could activate the archives. After clearing out the boulders blocking the entrance, I socketed the Iridescent Gem to activate the archives, and unlock the correct distilled knowledge to obtain the Astral Detector Blueprint. With the Astral Detector unlocked, I got enough material for two, headed back to the surface, and started searching for the two Celestial Sanctum pieces. With more insane luck than getting a Krampus sack, my Astral Detector dug up one of the pieces on the first try, right in the middle of my base. I also was pretty lucky with the second piece, since it wasn't located all that far from the first. By the time I brought both pieces to the coast off of Lunar Island, it was already the start of summer. Since this is the season where cactus produce flowers, I picked a few and made flower salad so I could give it to Pearl for Friendship Point 9. While on the island, I noticed that the lure plant finally appeared, so I killed it to obtain the final Friendship Point that in turn gave me Pearl's Pearl. With the most tedious part of the run pretty much done, it was now time to fight the final two bosses. The first is Crab King. The Astro Detector located him behind Lunar Island, which is actually a really good spot for him to be at, since it makes delivering the tribute really easy. Once at Crab King, I cleared out the rocks on one side, made a second grass raft away from him, and then socketed the pearl followed by 7 purple gems. Before putting in the last one, I unwrapped the bundle containing 40 killer bees and put them all to sleep with the pan flute, and then I put the last gem in to wake up Crab King. I immediately teleported to the second raft with the lazy explorer, and then paddled out of the range of the geyser attack. Once the bees woke up, they started relentlessly stinging Crab King, and all I needed to do was paddle from side to side whenever he tries to sink my raft with geysers. There are so many bees, and they attack so frequently that Crab King has no chance at healing himself. He has 23,000 HP, but with my 40 bees just constantly attacking him, he dies in less than 3 minutes. After Crab King is defeated, I use the pan flute to clear out all the killer bees and retrieve the Celestial Tribute with the Pynchon Winch. With this final piece, I socket the Tribute and the Sanctum next to the Icon in order to activate the Moonstorms. Helping Wagstaff complete his experiments is significantly easier using Wigfred than with a regular character in my opinion. 
since you need to give up your head slot in order to use the Astragals. The only option for armor is either the body slot or the shield of terror. Since Wigfrid has her natural 25% damage reduction and gains HP whenever she hits things, I find it viable to fight off hordes of birds without using any armor. Instead, I can equip both the Magi and Lazy Explorer to greatly boost my mobility, which in turn makes dodging projectiles and protecting the experiment a lot easier. After doing this three times and collecting all the infused moon shards and moon gleams, I paddled back to Lunar Island and completed the experiment to call down the Celestial Champion. For the CC fight, I'm bringing the strongest weapons that I have, Tudosite Clubs and Dark Swords. The two songs that I'm using are Heart Running Ballad for boosted healing and Weaponized Warble to increase the durability of my weapons. Because I beat Fuey for already, I have access to the Bone Helm and Bone Armor, which makes this fight a whole lot easier. The Bone Helm not only offers some protection against attacks, but it sets my enlightenment to zero, which means I won't have to worry about getting stunned or put to sleep by wandering gestalts. The Bone Armor completely blocks one attack every five seconds, which not only lets me play more aggressively, but it also preserves the durability of the Bone Helm. Phase one is the easiest phase. Celestial Champion will either do a flopping attack, summon a bunch of gestalts, or roll at you. The flopping attack is easy to dodge, especially if you know when it's about to happen, for the roll, I just equip the Lazy Explorer and run in 90 degree angles perpendicular to where he's traveling. When CC starts to summon Gestalts, I just continue attacking until they start to appear, run away and then come back once the summoning is over. After phase 1 is defeated, CC transforms into its second phase. This one isn't the most difficult form, but it can be the most punishing, since one mistake could mean eating hundreds of damage from its blender attack. The blender isn't really an issue if you're playing cautiously, but it can do some serious damage if you're overly aggressive like me at one point in this fight. Other than the blender, CC has three melee attacks, one is just a straight up melee, another hits the ground and summons spikes, and the last one will summon three waves of gestalts that deals over 130 damage each. The cool thing about using the bone armor is that you can just flat out ignore the basic and spike melee attacks, since CC takes over 5 seconds in between these moves. So the bone armor effectively increases Wigfrid's DPS, especially for phase 2. After phase 2 is defeated, CC assumes its final form. Before I fight him, I run back to my boat in order to exchange the thermal stone I was using for a cold one. This one is in my opinion the coolest, but also the most frustrating of all its forms. He has one sort of melee attack that he will only use when you're really close. Other than that, his primary move is firing lasers in two different patterns. Both patterns can be dodged by moving a little away from CC in a diagonal direction right before he fires them. The lasers hit twice, so you can't just ignore them with the bone armor. I pretty much fight him the same way any character does. His spires will make you sluggish and can put you to sleep, so I just avoid them while they are active or get CC to blow them up with lasers. For the Gestalt attack, I just equip the Lazy Explorer and run out of the circle. Since CC moves around so much, I switch from Tudosite Clubs to Dark Swords, since the swords deal more direct damage. Anyways, between Wigfrid's increased damage, regeneration, powerful weapons, and buffs from the Bone Armor set, this fight is significantly easier than doing it with a regular character or while riding a beefalo.
after fighting this guy for about an entire game day. CC finally dies at the start of day 67. With that, I've beaten all the raid bosses. That's the Shadow Pieces, Dragonfly, Kloss, Bee Queen, the Twins of Terror, Toadstool, the Ancient Fuel Weaver, Crab King, and the Celestial Champion. All defeated using the unique abilities of one of my favorite characters in the game. Although I've beaten all the raid bosses, I didn't end the run here. As I mentioned at the start of the video, Wakefruit's max potential is unlocked when she obtains the Dreadstone Armors and the Enlightened Crown. After beating Celestial Champion, I later decided to test out the Enlightened Crown combined with the Dreadstone Armor and Tudosite Clubs against Toadstool and Dragonfly, in order to see how easy these bosses are when Wakefruit is fighting them at max potential. If you want to see those fights, the link is in the description. Anyways, that's the end of the video. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did, and of course, like always, thanks for watching, take care, and have a great day.